he was definitely a Filipino icon. He was on his way to being the president of the Philippines, succeeding Mr. Marcos. Like Marcos, Ninoy was brilliant, shrewd, articulate, and disarming. Ninoy thundered from the Senate floor, criticizing Marcos and his generals, and bearing anomalies in government. Time and again, Ninoy would warn that Marcos was preparing to declare martial law to extend his stay in power. For these reasons alone, he was easily Marcos' most dangerous adversary. Even after being jailed at the start of martial law, Ninoy remained a thorn in the dictator's side. In 1975, Ninoy protested his imprisonment by going on a fast to the death, until he became so frail after 40 days that his family begged him to lift the fast. In 1977, the military tribunal found Ninoy guilty of crimes of subversion, murder, and illegal possession of firearms, and sentenced him to death by firing squad. To suffer the penalty of death by firing squad. But Marcos knew better than to turn Ninoy into a martyr. Marcos kept Ninoy alive and in jail, and even allowed him to lead the opposition in a run for a seat in parliament from prison. The elections were rigged, however, and the opposition lost. Eight years of imprisonment, most of it in solitary confinement, took a toll on Ninoy's health. And in 1980, he suffered a serious heart attack. He asked Marcos for permission to seek medical treatment in the U.S. Marcos pounced on the chance to finally be rid of Ninoy. It seemed like a good move to get him out of the country, as Ninoy was the only one who could unite a fractured opposition. But even while exiled in the United States, Ninoy continued his campaign against Marcos. I am therefore appealing to Mr. Marcos. Mr. Marcos, hear the cry of your people. You have been in office for 16 years. We do not want your blood. We do not want revenge. We do not want to hurt your family. We only ask that freedom be returned. Marcos, always worried that Ninoy would eventually come home, sent several delegations, including his wife Imelda, to prevent Ninoy from returning. So I told him, you know, Ninoy, you are now questioned as and perceived as CIA, and then there at home you were perceived as, as uh, NPA and so on and so forth. I said, you have, we have to be careful, especially we'll not put you back to jail because you're very sick. Maybe a house arrest, but we have to take care of you, but inform us so that you will be properly guarded. I want to prove to Mr. Marcos that not only comfort and material things are the demands of the flesh, that there is an indomitable spirit that will be willing to take any sacrifices for our people. I shall therefore go back to the Philippines. We were all expecting somebody's going to come and lead us out like Moses out of the, uh, you know, out towards the promised land, out of Egypt. It was beautiful. I mean, there was such a feeling of hope that somebody was going to come in and he was going to uh, make the moves. On August 13th, 1983, Ninoy began a circuitous journey from the U.S. to Manila using a fake passport. To throw Marcos off his trail, he passed through Singapore, Johor, and Hong Kong, before landing in Taiwan, which had no diplomatic relations with the Philippines. From a hotel room in Taipei on the eve of his flight to Manila, Ninoy gave one last interview that seemed almost prophetic. You have to be very ready with your hand camera because this action can become very fast. Yes. In a matter of what, three, four minutes, it could be all over, you know. And <laughs> I may not be able to talk to you again after this. Ninoy knew that going home to the Philippines was a gamble and that he was gambling with his life. Talking to reporters on that final plane ride home, he made this very clear. My feeling is we all have to die sometime. Now, if it's my fate to die by an assassin's bullet, so be it. But I cannot be petrified by inaction or fear of assassination and therefore stay in a corner. But before he could even step on Philippine soil, 
the man touted as the next president of the Philippines, was dead from an assassin's bullet. Under mounting international pressure, Marcos had to clear his government of suspicion in the murder. In October 1983, two months after the murder, Marcos formed a fact-finding body headed by former appeals court justice Corazon Agrava. The Agrava Commission was unprecedented in its breadth and depth. 163 witnesses, 480 pieces of evidence, submitted by a battery of lawyers from both the defense and the prosecution. The board reached a bold conclusion based on the bullet trajectory, the testimony of witnesses, and audio and video recordings, Ninoy's own escorts, the men tasked by government to protect him, instead shot him in the head as he descended the service stairs to the tarmac. The commission said Ninoy's killer could only be either Corporal Rogelio Moreno or Sergeant Filomeno Miranda, both of whom were behind Ninoy as he descended the service stairs. Rolando Galma, the alleged gunman, was no more than a fall guy, the report stated. In fact, it was determined that Galman was a petty criminal who was also used by the military for dirty jobs. The board indicted 26 soldiers, including Marcos's powerful and influential Armed Forces Chief of Staff, General Fabian Ver. Ernesto Herrera was a member of the Agrava Commission. The evidence that was presented before the commission was very strong, that uh, he was uh, uh, shot by a military man uh, who was behind him on the, well, you know, going down the plane uh, uh, stairs. The sound captured by TV news cameras became the most vital piece of evidence. Much was made of the timing of the first shot. It was the one thing everyone agreed on that it was the shot that killed Aquino. The recording showed that 11 seconds elapsed from the moment Ninoy stepped out to the staircase to the sound of the first shot. In government's version of the events, Ninoy had already stepped off the stairs onto the tarmac when Golman shot him in the head. But the Agrava Commission noted one important fact. The service stairs had 19 steps. How did Ninoy and his burly escorts negotiate the narrow stairs in just 11 seconds? This led to an even bigger question. Was Ninoy already on the tarmac when the shot was fired, or was he still going down the stairs? Dr. Raquel Fortune is the country's leading forensic pathologist. She has revisited the case several times. So given the number of steps, the question now is how fast do you think you can make it from the top going down? And he was not alone. He was known to be escorted by several men as well. And you have the width of the steps. And it's only enough to comfortably uh, accommodate two people. I think in all likelihood, Senator Aquino was not yet on the tarmac, but still somewhere going down. Even more conclusive than the timing of the fatal shot were the voices coming from the stairs. <laughs> In the Philippine national language, the phrase Akona means I will do it. And Pusila, in a southern Philippine dialect, is an order to shoot. The Agrava Fact-Finding Commission talked to sound experts who identified the men who spoke the words. They were members of the boarding team. It was a charge that the team members denied. Another important piece of evidence was the trajectory of the bullet. In the autopsy report, the National Bureau of Investigation, or NBI, clearly stated that the trajectory was downward 
which supports the theory of a shooter standing at a higher elevation. This would explain, supposedly, how come uh, the bullet ended up with a hole here, because that cannot be disputed. But four months later, government investigators changed their story. The NBI now insisted their first autopsy was wrong and that the shot was really fired upward into Ninoy's skull. The bullet then hit the Petrus bone and was deflected downward to exit in Ninoy's chin. This new version of the NBI autopsy would support Marcos's claim that Galman shot Ninoy on the tarmac. Dr. Fortune disputed the NBI's findings. She says the Petrus bone was not hard enough to deflect a slug from a 357 Magnum.